the main danger I think is still poaching, to be honest. It's it's sad to say, like I guess ourselves humans are one of the dangers. Off gassing a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogel. I have been fascinated with turtles for as long as I can remember. A blissful feeling rushes through me at every encounter with these marine reptiles. It was great to sit down with Wei Key, a member of Bubbles Turtle Conservation located in Perinthian Islands in Malaysia. In this episode, we speak about raising awareness, protecting habitats, securing funds, volunteering, and how making little changes can go a long way. Please enjoy. Way key, how are you doing this beautiful morning? How's the weather down there in KL? Doing fine. It's just nice to be a bit rested after, you know, hard work on the island. Um, weather in KL, surprisingly not too hot this time around. I told the weather has been a bit erratic before I came back. But for the morning, pretty cool, pretty cool, not too bad. Nice to be back in cool weather. Okay, okay, cool, cool. I was actually just down there uh, last weekend. I had to go to the embassy to to renew my passport. And uh, and then I met up with some friends. I was able to get into the pool and get diving. So it was it was a good time. I enjoy every time I can get to Kale. And that's, uh, sorry, because uh, I, I get in the habit of calling it Kale, but that's Kuala Lumpur for all of you listeners out there. So yeah, I know some yeah. people, they're like, Kale, what is, what is that? What is that? So... But yeah, no, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you on. I'm excited to hear about Bubbles Turtle Conservation. So, you know, the first question I always like to ask is, tell me how and why you became a diver. Tell me about that first experience underwater, that first breath. All right. Oh, why I became a diver? Oh, how far back should I go for that? I, I, I suppose if I were to start, you know, when I was, you know, when you were like an impressionable young kid. Um, last time when you see documentaries on Discovery or Net Geo and you're like, wow, the world, the, the ocean looks amazing. And I was fortunate enough that, you know, my parents did take me, you know, oh, we are Malaysians, we should probably explore some places around Malaysia. So we went to the islands like Redang and then I was like, wow, the water is so clear. So I guess since then, it's kind of partially ingrained into me. Oh, you know, the ocean's nice. Eventually I got into environmental science as my degree and then when I was finishing my degree I was like oh shit you know if I'm going to work in the ocean I have to get my diving license so straight after graduation all right I've saved up some money call up, call up a few friends um, go to Perhentian which is such a big coincidence I went to Perhentian last time to get my open water qualification and now I'm working Perhentian but before we got we get too far off tangent so yeah I wanted to go into diving because I knew I wanted to go to work with the ocean and you can't work with the ocean if you can't dive. You can, but it's less hands-on, I suppose, if that's the right word for it. But yeah, going through my first breath, it was drier and colder than expected, to be honest. Although that might be a very technical answer, but it really was like a burst of air from the regulator. It goes like, and you're like, whoa. It's very different. Different, not in a bad way, but different from breathing on land, I suppose. Air doesn't go, doesn't rush into your throat when you breathe, when you breathe regularly. From a regulator, just like, it's like a soft blast of fresh air. You know, when you eat, what is that, number five chewing gum? That's how they describe it, I suppose. Uh. You, you see the advert where the, where the cold air blasts into their face. Somewhat a gentler version of that. But yeah, I think that was how it was for me, I suppose. But it was nice. Since then, uh, okay, diving, part the ocean, I guess that, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. I really love it. I think that's uh, absolutely awesome that you took your first breaths underwater in Perinthian and now you're working on Perinthian. So I think that's super cool. So obviously that wasn't planned. That just kind of happened. So how did you end up working for Bubbles Turtle Conservation? Uh, so how, how did I end up working with them? So what happened is uh, after I graduated, uh, I was working in a few places before because back then it was a bit harder to get into marine conservation. I think in Malaysia, the field is still in its infancy. And back then, I was working with my university for a while as a research assistant. I've worked in the jungle, 
Crown Forest Reserve in the Pahang State over there. I was helping some of the PhD students, um, let's see, gather, do their sampling, yeah, do their sampling in the forest, in the jungle. And we lived with the indigenous people for a bit. Mad respects to them though. The jungle was just too hardcore for me. We had to track 8 kilometers a day sometimes to get from village to village. Because the, the forest is quite dense, what happens is um, it takes one hour to cover one kilometer and you're carrying like 15, 15 kilo backpacks of you know, supplies going from village to village. Those students, they were passionate. They can do it. After a while, I'm like, oh no, this is too hardcore for me. I can't work in the forest or the jungle. So end up, after I was done with that project, I moved on you know, to helping out my parents. My mom has a project-based company. I was helping her out because she needed people to help manage some renovation work. And after that, I went to Canada on a working holiday. I was fortunate enough that my parents were quite encouraging. Oh, you know what? You should see a bit of the world. Learn, learn how different parts of the world is different than Malaysia. So I went, went there for six months. I was like, it was quite eye-opening. It was very nice. Um, at the same time, I also learned, okay, as an adult, you have to take care of things like taxes and living on your own and rent and everything. Oh, it was like an eye-opening experience. Finished that, came back here. And I got to help my parents for a while more. And then I saw an internship. I actually started off as an intern with Bubbles Turtle Conservation. But even before Bubbles Turtle Conservation started, it was basically just, instead of the company last night, it was just a department under Bubbles Dive Resort. So Bubbles Dive Resort basically has the dive shop, it has a restaurant, which has the kitchen crew, and the front of house, which is, which is reception. They have housekeeping. And con conservation was basically just another department for them. The founders were very nice. The founders decided, oh, you know, when we when we opened up at that little bay in Pulau Perhentian, you know, there were nesting turtles and they decided, oh, wow, uh, we are very fortunate to have turtles nesting on our beach. And we don't want, you know, they were former divers. Yes, they were former divers. They were dive instructors before that. They opened their own resort. And, you know, they kept in mind, you know, the diver mindset, you know, take care of the ocean. With turtles nesting on the resort, and they're like, oh, let's do this right. So they started the project first before I joined in, uh, since 2004. So this year, 2024, is their 20th anniversary, which is very nice for them. But yeah, so since back then, when they opened, without much information, because they came as divers, they didn't have formal training, but they did all their best. They went, reached out to people, reached out to organizations to get some information, and eventually they started the project. They didn't want to go down the route of fully, how to say, commercializing the thing, basically. In a sense, you know how some place says, okay, pay me, uh, pay us some money, you can hold the baby turtle and let it go. No, they, they wanted to go like the proper route where, okay, let's try to keep it, well, let's try to reduce as much human interaction as we can. Mostly, we, what, mostly what we do now is we just count them, move them into the bucket, measure them maybe for data to... You know, just to ascertain their health status. But that's about the human interaction that they have with baby turtles. The rest is just releasing and other people just watching them crawl down the water. We try to reduce touching as much as we can. But, you know, back to the main line of the story before we get too off tangent again. So basically, they were trying to do things right. And, you know, I started off as an intern in 2017. I saw their internship applications open and then applied. So I joined them from July to... October, which is the closing season. The former project facilitator, she was changing projects. The founders, Ronnie and PC, uh, back then, uh, well, one of them asked, oh, well, since you're here, do you want to, you know, run the project next year? You're kind of familiar with it. So next year being 2018, now I was like, yes, please. Thank you. So they, they, they kind of gave me the big break into uh, getting into marine conservation. So I am very thankful for that. Yeah, so I was running the project since 2018. Back then, it was still known as the Bubbles Turtle and Reef Experience. And so, yeah, I've been with them since 2018, 19. During the pandemic 2020, I was, I, we were there. And 2021, that was the toughest year, to be honest. So it was just a very small skeleton crew. And I was still there in 2022, 23. Um, till today, 2024. Where exactly? So I have not been to Perinthian. It's actually on the list, and and I'm hoping. I don't know if I'll be able to make it there before October. 
but when you arrive, can you tell me where the resort is? How to how to basically how you would get to the conservation project? Coming from mainland, uh, most visitors, uh, what I would recommend, if you're coming by bus, there's a bus station nearby, Kuala Besut bus station. If you're coming in by flight, fly in to Kota Baru instead of Kuala Terengganu. So these are the two airports somewhat close to the place. From Kota Baru, it's a one-hour ride by van. If it's from Kuala Terengganu, it's one and a half hours. So usually, it's yeah to Kota Baru by flight or to Kuala Besut bus station by bus or by car. And then that's Kuala Besut jetty. So it's about a 40-minute a boat ride, speed boat, I think. It's not like the large ferry like some islands have. For Pulau Perhentian, there's a lot of medium-sized speed boats which go back and forth to the island. And yeah, speed boat, you come to Pulau Perhentian, there's Pulau Perhentian, we have two islands. Pulau Perhentian Kecil, which is basically small, and Pulau Perhentian Besar, which is big. So we are on the big island, and we are on the south side of the big island. So you come in and you when the ferry turns in. So the, the funny thing about our place is that not too many ferries like to go to our place in a sense. Um, it's good for the turtles, you know, not too much, you know, boat traffic, but annoying for humans sometimes in a sense where they don't like going to the small hidden far end corner of the island. And they're like, oh, it's so far. Can I just drop you out off at the marine park? I'm like, no, can you go bring us, uh, can you bring me direct? <laughs> But fortunately, we do have a an arrangement with one boat company, uh, Brokat. So they are they are the regular boat guy, which you know most of our visitors come by with. Um, if we go if they go with the other boats, sometimes they they have a tendency to drop them off at you know elsewhere. But we have like a regular boat guy which will which work with us, yeah. So yeah, coming in to that small corner, you turn into a little bay. It is about. 500 meters across, and the beach even further back inside is about 250 meters. And yeah, it's a private little beach uh, with our project site uh, over there. Yeah, it's good for the turtles in a sense. You know, it's quiet. Yeah, we, can, we can easily control the lights and everything. It's a private little place. So some people may not like it in a sense, you know, they want the party scene. They're like, oh, I need the bar. I need the party. Oh, you have different strokes for different folks, you know. Our place might not be too suitable because the bar does, or the restaurant does close at 10. But some people who likes the quiet, the peace, who are just want to break away from the city for a bit. It's a nice place to visit. It's a quiet little place. Um, and just a, a, a quick question. So you said control the lights. What did you mean by that? Since we are the only place over there, by 10 p.m., we switch off or most, if not all, our regular lights, white light, yellow light, we turn it off. And in our restaurant, or whichever you know place faces the beach side of things, we use red lights. Because, you know, when we dive, the color red is the first color that disappears underwater. So turtles have lived so long without seeing the color red. I think they have green and yellow icons, if, I'm not, if I recall correctly. Um, so yeah, they can see near ultraviolet. They can see greens. They can see, yeah, but for red, they can't really see the color red. So for us, we use red light. So we are very used to seeing red lights, but the turtles are not. So at least we can see ourselves moving around. We can still see the place. But the turtles, you know, since it's red light, it's not super bright for them. They are less affected by it. So they are more encouraged to nest. So this is behind a tree line. So our location, we maintain a tree line. So we have not none of our buildings are, you know, for beachfront, you know, like how some places like to promote. I mean, for us, we maintain our trees, so whatever leakage of light or sound remaining is basically buffered by the tree line. So we try to keep keep the place as encouraging as possible for the turtles to come up and nest. I have seen the, the red lights, and maybe I've been told about that, but I wasn't quite sure. So, yeah. And what mainly what type of turtle is nesting in in that area so for us mainly we get green turtles colonia midas we mostly get them Berhantian, is that to say that while we see hawksbill swimming in the water we do not really see them nesting on land for our for our project site our last hawksbill nest was 
in 2020, and that was a singular hospital nest. But the rest were all green turtles. So I think for their numbers in Prohantian is not doing too well, if I recall correctly, which is quite sad. You know, me and us and the other project, Prohantian Turtle Project, you know, we keep looking for, oh, is there, are you guys having hawksbill nest this year? Did you guys guess, did you guys get a hawksbill? No, we didn't get it this year, we didn't get it this year. So it's quite sad to hear that the hawksbill's nests are getting less and less. But we are mostly working with uh, green turtles. Uh, green turtles are done mostly nesting on our beach. And actually, I just wanted to bring it back a, a little bit. So um, my, actually a goal of mine is to, so I drove out, so I'm based in Penang, basically just right across the coast from, or right across the land from Kota Baru. But we, we did a road trip to Kota Baru nice. um, last year. Uh, it was crazy. It was super busy. It was during Chinese New Year, so there was a ton of traffic. But beautiful drive from Penang over to Kota Baru. Long drive, but <laughs> beautiful drive. And I'm hoping to, because I've, I've made some friends with people from Perinthian, so I'm hoping to make it out there and then now, you know, hope making another friend right now. So I'll have to come and visit and, and take the drive from Penang. That way, I, I, it's it's such a pain because the flight is easier, but I don't think, I don't, I'm not sure if there's a direct flight from Penang to Kota Baru. I might be wrong on that. Is there? I think we have had some guests coming from Penang recently. They have one flight a day to Kota Baru, straight up to Kota Baru from Penang, if I recall correctly. I should have asked them a bit more about that. Sorry about that, Nick. But yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's totally fine. Uh, it's something I need to look into because it's always a, 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 you know, not a, not a, I mean, I guess there's positives on both sides. Like if I can drive, I can bring all my stuff, all my dive gear. I don't have to worry about the weight of all the luggage. If I fly, it's faster, but then I have to, you know, figure out transport from wherever, you know, the airport to wherever I'm going. But either way, um, so uh, I wanted to ask a question because I, the, what you had mentioned about the less human activity towards the turtles, because I was thinking of when you were saying that as I've been to like a few or I've been to one, I'm sorry, one elephant sanctuary, but I was reading a lot about it. And I remember hearing about like the, the best elephant sanctuaries to go to are the one where there's little to no human contact with the elephants and humans. So you have some of these sanctuaries where they will, you know, kind of like what you're saying, like, oh, pay us and you can hold a turtle. And it's like, oh, OK, pay us and you can go mess around with the elephants and hang out with them and all that stuff and, and come to find out that that's not like the greatest thing. So do you find that a lot with other conservation projects that they're kind of more for the financial benefit rather than actually helping the, the cause? It's a good thing that you brought it up because more people should be aware uh, in a sense where this is a gray area, which a lot of, projects you know struggle with in a sense so um for my project bubbles better conservation we are very fortunate that bubbles dive resort is the basically the parent company or the parent owner of it and because they are a resort operation they do have a steady flow of income coming in and they decide oh because you know guests and visitors come in um there's a there's a way to finance the project which is, um, yeah, so it uh, gave us or gave them the freedom to, you know, okay, let's try to do things with less human interaction as close as natural as possible. Um, even for us, we still bring guests to view the turtles in the sense we want to create an awareness and emotional connection between the guests. So we bring them to watch the nesting mothers cover their nests. We don't bring them any earlier because any earlier the mothers are still, you know, very sensitive. You know, oh, I'm still afraid. I still need to find a location for my eggs. If someone, if someone scares them, they're like, okay, I'm not going to lay. I'm going to leave. So we do bring guests to see them from a safe distance only after, you know, they start covering their nest. So after that, their eggs are dealt with, move to the hatchery. After they, they have done their body pit, their chambering, their egg laying. Once they're focusing on covering the nest, that's the only time which you bring the guests, you know, to view them from a safe distance. For our hatchlings, what we do is we count them, put them in the bucket, bring them down the beach, set up a barrier, 
so the gas cannot stand inside the barrier, keeps the gas out, and then in the center, so the barrier is left and right, gas are outside left and right, in the center where it's empty, that's where we release baby turtles to help, no? let them crawl down the beach. So we are fortunate enough that the resort is financing part of the project and we are able to do it with as little human interaction as possible. But we also realize, you know, there's still like this small interaction required to create, where the interaction required such as viewing. So when they see a turtle in person, they create an emotional connection. Wow, I really love the turtle. I want to support conservation projects. I want to throw less rubbish in the ocean. Or maybe, maybe I can start with small lifestyle changes, instead of, you know, constantly buying a plastic bottle, I'm going to, you know, get a proper container and keep reusing it. So when the guests view, view and see the turtle, they feel an emotional connection. Some people may argue at some places, oh, the best, there is no people at all. Protect the whole beach, don't let people go in and give the turtles a place to nest in peace. Which is how some places or some conservation project run their turtle, their turtle conservation. So we don't knock against that either because you know, they have their own way of supporting their project and doing things. And then moving further down the scale, which you know costs a bit more money, so some projects may require a bit more for financial support. So that's why they do things like bring people, ask people to pay money to see the turtles. Maybe on the extreme side of it, it's a bit bad in the sense where, oh yeah, yeah, all right, pay me money, now you can hold the turtle. Uh, and then you can play with the turtle. So it's a very, um, it is a scale basically. And, you know, each project have their own justification for it. I guess for us, we still allow viewing so people can create a human emotional connection. So we can raise awareness about the turtles, you know, so people can do lifestyle changes. Or, you know, people can help turtles in the way they want. And then, in a sense, how some projects go to the extreme of pay money to feed the turtles in their tank. Maybe that's a bit too far. Maybe, yeah, that's not so good. But, you know, it's a scale. It's a scale. You know, long story short, it's a scale. But at the extreme end of high cost of money involved may not be the best way to go about it. That does have to be a fine balance because if people aren't aware of what's going on, then they don't know how... The, they they don't know the things that they can do to help in the long run. Like you're saying, when when they build that emotional connection, it prompts them to be like, you know what, I'm I'm not gonna use this straw, or I'm not gonna I'm I'm gonna bring a reusable bag instead of a plastic bag. I'm gonna you know a reusable bottle. So yeah, I could definitely understand that there that there is a fine line. Um, on, on average, how many eggs is a turtle laying? For the green turtles that we're working with, on average, it's about 80 to 120. Um, we have seen less, like 60, 50 eggs, but those are rare. We have seen 150 plus, almost 160, but also those are rare. So the average that we get is about 80 to a, between 80 and 120 eggs. Not not to get like morbid or anything, but is there, like out of all the eggs that are laid, do all of them survive or is it... Like, what? what's the percentage of... Uh, uh, the hatching rate? Yeah, the hatching rate. There we go. <laughs> no, 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 no worries, no worries. Uh, but, um, yeah, no, it's it's the, this is the fact of reality. You know, not all the eggs are going to hatch all the time. So, uh, for us, I think our hatching percentage averages out about mid-high 80s, so about 85, 86, sometimes 90. But there will be some eggs uh, which just do not develop or just stop in their developmental stages. We have the rare occasion where, you know, 100% of the eggs hatch and we're like, wow, this is amazing. But we have also had the rare occasional occasion where the whole, the whole nest just didn't hatch. Uh, uh. We opened it. None of the eggs were fertilized. We were very surprised. Just They were all just egg yolk and egg white. And we're like, oh... You know, we feel bad for the mother turtle in the sense she spent so long coming up the nest and all her eggs were not fertilized. And we're like, oh, it's just a bit sad. But, you know, it's happened. It, it's life. It's something that's bound to happen. But yeah, interesting question. The average about, you know, for us, I think it's about between 80 and 90%. Yeah, that's got to be that's got to be sad just because I still to this day, turtles are probably my favorite marine uh, animal just because it's it's yeah I 
absolutely love them. Some people, you know, they kind of get sick of them after a while. I'm like, nah. I mean, you can even kind of see I have a, a turtle right in the background. Uh, it's nice. It's nice. Very cute. Yeah, I, I, uh, the IKEA special right there. Um, but what type of dangers would the nests face if there wasn't somebody there to protect them? The main danger, I think, is still poaching. To be honest. It's, it's sad to say, I, I guess ourselves humans are one of the dangers to it. Poaching has been made, at least for green turtles. Uh, okay, so before this poaching in Peninsula Malaysia, um, the law only protected leatherback turtles in all Peninsula Malaysia state. Sabah, Sarawak, the two states of Malaysia on the Borneo side, they've been protecting all four species of turtle in Malaysia for a long time already. In Peninsula Malaysia, we are actually like quite behind. Only the leatherbacks protected. And fortunately, as of, if I recall correctly, middle of 2022, the law has been updated, at least for Terengganu State, to protect all four species of Malaysian turtles. The leatherback, the green, the hawksbill, and the olive ridley. So even now, on Perhentian Island, there are still people or poachers going around, you know, stealing eggs. They look for empty beaches, go up to it, they see a turtle track, they're like, okay. They'll take a metal rod, stab the sand, look for the nest, and nice, that's our egg. They get out, bring it to the market the next day, sell it. It's still a realistic thing that happens. Enforcement is difficult because it's an open ocean. The poachers can, you know, can still run. It may be easy to spot them, but to cover such an area, a large area for patrol, it's also not easy. Our project site is fortunate that, you know, because we are there, whenever poachers sh go near to a beach, they'll take their spotlight, shine on the beach and look for tracks. They'll take a metal rod, stab the location until they find the eggs where they find the nest. That's how they find the eggs and that's how they will take it out, take it away. But if there's human presence over there, they're like, oh, it's too much hassle. We'll go to another beach. So if the project, or if we weren't there, what's going to happen is, oh, to them is another empty beach and they're like okay this beach is right this beach is you know hassle free for us to take the turtle lakes yeah it's still happening today they are you know going to other parts of the island when there are no human presence they're still you know, racing against the local rangers so we have local rangers who collect eggs for conservation and then we also have the poachers you know going around the island oh, oh there's, no, there's no one here there's no one here okay let's quickly grab the eggs bring it to the market but yeah so you were mentioning threats to the turtle eggs or the turtle nest if a, if a project, our project wasn't there. I think number one would be humans set the sale. Um, following that, I guess, would be you know, natural predators like monitor lizards or fungus or army ants where you know, they'll just dig through the soil and consume whatever nest they find in their way, crabs. But those are, I guess, natural predators. So, they don't harm the nest too much. I guess after humans, the next biggest threat would be more into lizards because they have a strong sense of smell that they can look for a nest and eat the egg. But for that, I think in a location where some projects where they don't have a hatchery, where they just protect the beach instead, that that's bound to happen to some nests, but there are you know, still other nests around. But if there's poaching in the area, I guess the biggest threat would be humans and poaching, you know, steal the eggs. Take it to market, sell it. Is there a big market for turtle eggs? Yes, I think in East Coast Peninsula, Malaysia, even in Malaysia in general, some parts of Malaysia, there's still a cultural delicacy, I suppose. It's been from a long time ago, the consumption of turtle eggs. People, people found eggs on the beach, they're like, oh wow, this is food sauce I can feed my family with. And I guess after town city got better we have more food source what happens is you know it's still a habit that you know they keep in some parts of malaysia total egg consumption is still normal the market is last time in terengganu i think the old pricing average on the east coast was three to five ringgits per egg so if each nest let's say has 100 eggs on average between 80 and 120 um that's 300 to 500 ringgit per nest that they managed to collect. And what happened after the enforcement in Terengganu by 2022, mid-2022, 
after they enforce the law where all species of turtles are protected, so green turtle eggs, you can't legally sell it anymore. There was a price spike in Kelantan, our neighboring state, because they can't easily get eggs, and they can't as easily get eggs, turtle eggs anymore, Turangani. So due to the lack of supply, or the harder supply, I think the price shot up momentarily to 10 ringgit per egg. So there is a market, although I think the market is slowly reducing. The younger generation now, they are less inclined to eat turtle eggs already. As we were chatting last week to line up this interview, you were saying that you were going around to schools to kind of bring aware, or well, I'm, I'm assuming bring awareness and just promote the, the project. What type of information are you giving to the students? What's the message that you're trying to get across when you're visiting these schools? Depending on the age group, also depending on the school's goals. So some schools now, I think they are trying to get aligned with social developmental goals going around. So ours, we are aligned with uh, SDG 14, Life Underwater. So they invite us to talk a bit about marine conservation. So for, for I think for the talks, usually I will head over to the school. I'll talk a bit about turtles. Just you know, let the, the, the kids know, oh wow, this is the turtles that we have. This is how cool they are. Because each, each one of them almost has like a special thing unique to them. Uh, they all live really has mass beaching, although not in Malaysia, other parts of the world they have mass beaching. Leatherbacks can dive to a depth deeper than the total height of two of both our twin towers. The green turtles have green body fat and the hawks bills their poisonous meat um, from all the jellyfish and sea sponge that they've eaten. So they, they find it, wow, so cool, the turtles in Malaysia. And then after that, we move on into the conservation world of things. Oh, we talk a bit about or the turtles are facing this track. Plus, they confuse plastic with jellyfish. So that's one thing. There are many concerns that affect the turtle, but the easiest message to share is that a plastic bag looks like a jellyfish. And the kids are like, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, it looks very similar. There are other threats, like human threats, poaching. There are climate change. And then we move on next to the conservation work. Or oh, this is uh, the work that we do. This is what our project does. Share with them that you know, conservation work marine conservation is available in Malaysia. Yeah, there are groups that are doing their best to protect sea turtles. And then I guess, I guess the last segment is or what you can do to help. So they don't have to, oh, I'm going to save the world now. Uh, we let everyone know that we can just start with small things, you know, small lifestyle changes, as mentioned earlier. You know, maybe carpool with your friend, um, you know, just to reduce the amount of emissions going into the atmosphere. Maybe just bring a bottle around, you know, instead of buying another bottle, plastic bottle, another plastic bottle. Or maybe just bring a bag while shopping. So all these little things that we can do, not only helps the turtle, but just helps the world in general. So earlier, you, I, I, I can't remember if you were saying that uh, when you first started that the marine conservation was still in its infancy, I want to say in Malaysia. Were you saying that about kind of now or back then? I guess where is marine conservation at in Malaysia now? Is it something that is being heavily promoted? Is it still in its infancy? Like where where would you say marine conservation is currently in Malaysia? I think currently it's growing, which is a good sign. So last time, I guess back when I started 2017, or even when I wanted to study for it back in 2012, 2014, somewhere around there. We have some local universities, thankfully, even up till now, back then till now, they are providing marine-based marine, uh, marine -based degrees, although I can't remember the, the exact names of it. There were some accessible source of it, but in KL, there was almost or literally zero marine conservation-based education. There was some places offering forestry, but conservation-based stuff, there wasn't too many selection. A lot of kids now, or back then, even to a certain extent now, oh, you have, you have to be an engineer, you have to be a doctor, you have to be a lawyer, that kind of thing. Uh, so back then, it was a bit more difficult. I was very fortunate, actually, that my parents allowed me to explore uh, this career path. So I couldn't find many conservation, so I went into environmental science and I put uh, environmental science. So it was mostly a very 
generalist kind of course. So when I joined the field in 2017 as an intern, there were some organizations, I think Perhentian Turtle Project is still around back then. We are around. Uh, See True. See True is a turtle conservation project based with University of Malaysia Turangani. They have been around for a long time also. But yeah, career positions for marine conservation in Malaysia back then was very hard to find. It's getting better now, actually. It's growing now. So I guess back then it's still in, in its infancy. There are projects around. It's not heavily promoted. But I think now it's growing. There are more projects around. There are more rules available. Schools are actually promoting um, marine conservation as part of their social development. Part of their education curriculum, you know, as part of the social development goals. Last time, there was no such mention of it. We have science subjects. You learn science, you learn biology, chemistry, physics. But there was almost no mention of conservation. But now, yeah, they're introducing it into the curriculum now. That's amazing to see because, I mean, the kind of sad reality of it is it's it's like that all over the world, right? Like, even in the United States, like, there is a big push, but then there's also an equal push back against it. Like, oh, we don't need to do this. We don't need to do that. And it's kind of a sad thing to see that it's not being promoted more throughout the world. And and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but I definitely think that there's more that could be done to help. But on a more positive note, so somebody that wants to come and volunteer, because uh, looking through the website, you guys have a few programs. Do you want to talk about a little bit of the programs that a volunteer can come and be involved in? Um, we have two ways, or three, I suppose. We have the experiential program. It's a six days, five night thing. So what happens in that is, what well, in that week, um, everything is included, accommodation. Basically, they will arrive on the island. Our team will share with them on how we work with turtles. So they will join us. They'll help us scribe when we you know, record data from, from the turtles, such as their shell measurements, like their curved carapace length or their curved carapace width. They join us when we do facial ID identification of the turtles. We take picture of their face left and right. And then next day, what we do is we go through our catalogs. We are giving them a guided experience how turtle conservation works. So for one week, they get like a experience of it, I suppose, if that's a, the right word. And we get to, you know, explore the field a bit. Oh, so this is how, maybe not in its entirety, but this is how part of the turtle conservation is. And then we also have the internship program. So I think we are trying to give back in a sense where students who are still doing their courses, but basically they want to get some starting work experience in the conservation field. So that's what our internship program provides. That's about three or so months. All they have to do is get there. And once they get there, they will provide the training, the help, the food, the accommodation. They'll be living on site. And we will train them to a level where they can independently collect data, work with their girls, interact with guests, share knowledge with other people. And then, I guess the last one is, although this is not too big yet, because the project is still small, we are looking for people who want to work with our project. General open one, the one week experience, six days, five nights, Everyone, anyone can join us, you know, just to see how conservation, the conservation world is like. As part of your job is to just kind of go around and then promote and bring awareness, I'm assuming. Is that why it, you're in KL now? Or like, are you headed back to the project soon? Myself, my role is, I suppose, is a bit of everything. Uh, in a sense where I still help out with a bit of training. But thankfully, right now, the project is the data with us. She's doing very well. She's taking care of the team on site, which allowed me to do the next part of my role, which is you know, uh, basically raising awareness. So going to schools, talking to schools. And I suppose, in a sense, what has to be brought up to some projects. We can't shy away from this topic. Look for funding, basically. You know, communicate with companies. You know, Oh, would you like to do your CSR with us, your corporate, corporate social responsibility with us? Would you like to come over? And then, you know, when they stay over, they pay for food and accommodation and the time that they spend with them. So basically, just bring, secure their funding. And then other than that, look for grants. So yeah, long story short, basically my role is, aside from training, which is mostly um, team training, which is mostly handled by the facilitator for now, 
she's doing such a great job. Um, the next thing I'm looking, my, the other part of my role is raising awareness and also looking for funding. Yeah, that's a long story short, the whole thing. No, I mean, it's, it's uh, definitely a, a necessity to be able to fund these projects. And, and do you find it hard to find funding? Is it something that's like a, a difficult task? Is it, you know, are people willing to help? It's a mix of easy and hard. You know, some people are like very generous. They're like, oh, wow, I really love what you're doing. Here's a donation. Here's a sponsorship. I think the sponsors. But yes, personal sponsorship, as many people sponsor or donate, it trickles in. It's not a big amount, but it's also at least still an amount that we're thankful for. You know, it still helps us. I guess the next hardest thing is securing long-term large funding. So like grant application. So grant, even the grant application is once a year and then next year to apply again and it's not a 100% chance you get it. And for ourselves, because right now we are aiming to get our social enterprise accreditation, we have not gotten it yet. We are still in the process of applying for it. For some organizations, they might be less inclined to donate because they're like, oh, I'm not sure if you're like an NGO or an NPO for a social enterprise. Uh, why should I donate to you? And some grants are not open for application for regular companies. They have, you must have at least an accreditation as, as either one of those three things to be able to apply for grants. So I think one thing they're working towards too is getting a social enterprise accreditation to be able to apply for grants, which will help us get at least a large sum of funding that come in and help the project. So I like to uh, end on some sort of advice question. We're talking about the, the conservation side of things. What is the one piece of advice that you could give to somebody that wants to help out little or small? What can they do? And I know that we've talked about some of the things already throughout the episode, but kind of on a last note, what is the best piece of advice that you could give for somebody that wants to help out little or small? I suppose the best piece of advice would be to stay curious in a sense where if you're wondering how do I help out, the best thing is look into it. I guess we, what, one, one good thing now that we have is internet, even asking people, the right people, or you're looking up like books or you're going online, as long as we are curious to find out, we can always find ways to help out, to help in the cause that we want. So not just in conservation, in any cause that we would like to help with, stay curious, go online, look for a book, look up or you know, find the relevant people, talk to people, read, read about it, you know, or surf the internet about it. That's the best way to find out how to help, the best way to find out the right uh, donation channels, the best way to find out what you need to do personally, or the best way to find out, oh, how do I get into that career? With all the resources at our fingertips, as long as we're curious, we get the answer that we want. I love that piece of advice. And I really, really want to thank you for joining the podcast today. I know we had some some location uh, uh, changes in the middle of it. so uh, But no, I absolutely appreciate it. And I, I really hope, like I said, I don't know if I'll be able, I should try to make it to Perinthian before the end of, before the, the they close for the season. But I'll, I'll definitely try to come and visit. And no, this has been absolutely wonderful. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for providing me the platform to share all the information that I know of. It's nice to be on the podcast. It's my first time being on podcast. So yeah, thanks. Thank you for providing the opportunity. Offcasting, a scuba podcast.